Okay. So, uh, I'm Gilmore. I write on uh, Twitter, I am not your broom, and occasionally on a website of shoehornwithteeth.com. And by perfect coincidence, I have a Dr. Seuss reference. Uh, my favourite book when I was a kid was If I Ran the Circus by Dr. Seuss. And when I was looking for a theme for this presentation, uh, this is the first thing that actually came to mind. So I present the Gradient Circus. circus. Uh, this is not actually a, an overview of the syntax of CSS gradients, because there are plenty of examples of these online. Uh, this is actually more about the, the in-depth concepts of how they work. Uh, but just briefly, there are two different types of gradients you can use, linear and radial, and each of those has a single and a repeating version. Many of us might have used uh, gradient generators online, which produce a whole bunch of different vendor prefix syntaxes, and you have to blot in this huge blob of code. But you don't actually need to do that anymore, because every browser that supports gradients today supports them without prefixes. As any circus is divided into various acts, and this is no different. So I'll quickly race through some of the, the tips and tricks that you can use gradients for. Now you can use them for incredible repeating patterns. There's a community collaborated site. You can combine them with CSS blend modes and produce even more in interesting patterns. You can use them for art projects. Uh, each one of these pictures uh, is generated with just a single div element and gradients and box shadows. Uh, taking inspiration from that, I uh, revamped my open source site and every one of these pictures is a gradient. If you are going to be doing a lot of work with this, you might want to debug them. Uh, there is a fantastic Chrome extension uh, called Gradient Inspector, which breaks down the individual gradients that go into an element. Gradients can also be used for slightly more practical concerns of uh, placeholder images. As images are loading, uh, Gradify is a tool that generates background gradients server-side so that there's a smoother transition when your images finally load. And if you want to animate them, it's not quite so great. The images specification actually says that background images can't be animated at all. There's future specs that say they sort of can, and the browsers completely disagree on how to do it. Uh, Chrome and Safari allow you to crossfade two images, where it just fades one into the other. IE and Edge don't do that at all, but they do handily have the ability to transition individual gradient color stops into each other for smooth color animations, and Firefox doesn't do anything at all. And one of these future specs also defines a new type of gradient, which is conic gradient. Now, conic gradients are not about singer-songwriters from the 90s but they are, in fact, a gradient that actually goes around a point rather than being in a straight line. They were first proposed by Leah Veru at CSSConf US last year. Uh, she worked with the spec authors at the W3C to get this into the next level of uh, image specs and has also produced a polyfill for us to use and experiment with today. Now, if we want to get this in browsers properly, the best way is to actually use the polyfill, use it in projects, show the browser vendors that it's useful, and drum up demand. So for example, you could actually use it for the middle image, which is um, for like a color pickup. Uh, or you can use it for pie charts, which was Leah's original use case. Or in fact, you could use it for the background of this slide. Which brings us into Act 2, background image layering. Now, multiple background images can be combined on an element. This is how a lot of these gradient tricks work. But it's probably good to go into the, uh, just the tricks of how the browsers use it. So you can only ever have one background color per element, but you can have a practically infinite number of images. And if you think about a, a real painter with a canvas, they'll paint the background color first, and then they'll progressively draw more and more images on top. And this is how browsers render multiple images. But in CSS, you actually define the images from the top first. So if we split this one out, we have my wonderfully hand-drawn image here, which is the PNG, then a linear gradient, a radial gradient, and finally the background color. The browser then actually just squishes them together and combines them all into one picture. 
Uh, a lot of those gradient gallery tricks also use different positions and sizes on the images. So for example, here we actually have two notches taken out of the corners. You can't do that with just one gradient alone. And you can't just layer two full-size gradients because they'll kind of cancel each other out. So the way to do that is to actually have two differently sized images, 60% width here, and just position them in, di in different places. So the browser then combines them up together and produces a smooth image. Now, we start to get into a bit more of the, uh, the technical and mathematical code. Linear gradient angles are ones that have caught people out before about exactly where the gradient color stops are defined. And I would go into this except, one, this is a short talk, and two, I can't possibly do a better job than Patrick Brossett did. Patrick is a uh, developer on the Firefox DevTools team, and he's written the most comprehensive article I've ever seen about how linear gradients work. Uh, I will send around links to this as well after the talk, because um, I can't do better than this. But what he also put out was a little tool that allows you to test out gradients and see the internal calculations of how a browser would actually work out how to render it. OK, so color calculations. This is actually what spurred me to write the talk. I was trying to work out how browsers render the colors to the screen. Now, if we start with a basic example, we've got a gradient from a bluish to a reddish color. And these are just two color stops defined in HSL syntax. And they're pretty similar syntaxes. And a lot of people have expected browsers to then just say, all right, well, I'll take the, the 220 and take it down to 0. And I'll take the 50% lightness and take it to 60%. But the specification actually says that the very first thing it should do is convert everything to RGBA and then interpolate those numbers. And the reason is because colors can be defined in any number of different syntaxes. And so converting them all to RGBA gives consistency for everything. So for example, here at 50%, the red, green, blue, and alpha channels are all exactly halfway between the start and end values. This is, oh, yeah. this is all well and good uh, until transparency gets involved. Now, a lot of developers in the early days of gradients would transition to transparent and have this nice smooth fade out except that it actually kind of comes across on the screen there. But the one on the left is a little bit darker than the one on the right. And the reason is that transparent is a keyword for specifically fully transparent black, RGBA 0000. And as you're fading out the gradient, you're also transitioning all the colors to black. The spec then said, mm, this isn't quite what people actually wanted. So we'll use a trick called pre-multiplied alpha to produce a slightly better result. Uh, most of the browsers today use this. Safari is the notable exception. Canvas and SVG also still use the old method, but they have much lower level APIs for manipulating color. The best way to work around this is to actually define two different color stops at exactly the same point, one of which is, so for example, here from red to a fully transparent red, then instantly switch to a fully transparent blue, and then go to normal blue. So what the hell is pre-multiplied alpha anyway? Well, after a bit of digging around, you finally find the CSS compositing and blending level one spec, which gives you this very simple, easy to understand formula, and now everyone knows what it is. <laughs> it, OK, so. We'll take a diversion into how color blending actually works to try and understand what they're talking about. So up here, I've defined a partially transparent red square on a white square. But if I take a color picker and I select that square, it's not going to tell me that it's a partially transparent red. It's going to give me some other value. And to work out what that value is, we take the original color, the source color that we're trying to draw, and we take the destination, which is the background you're drawing it onto. 
The first thing we do is we multiply every color channel in the source by its alpha. So in this case, we take 60% of the red. Then we take the inverse of the alpha, so 40%, because 100 minus 60 is 40, and we apply that to the destination. So we take 40% of every channel of the destination, and we just add them together. And the final value that a color picker will tell you is that this is RGB 255-102-102. This is the basis of every single bit of color that you see drawn to a screen in a browser. So back to gradients. We have two gradients here. They are both defined exactly the same way. The top one is the old style that Safari will still render, and the bottom one is with pre-multiplied alpha. The reason the top one happens is that if we graph out the values of red and alpha all the way along this gradient, they're both going from full to none. But at every point along this gradient, the browser is also trying to multiply the red by the alpha. And so it's, the red is being reduced once along the gradient and then reduced again when it's multiplied. If you add the two of them together, you actually get this kind of curve in the color values. It's no longer actually a linear gradient. When you then add in the amount of background red, again, you get a kind of dip. And this is actually what produces the darkness in the middle of the gradient there. So pre-multiplied alpha is the answer. But what is it? It's that. No, that's, that's still not actually particularly understandable. The best way I found to understand it was actually to just imagine a conversation between the browser and the graphics processing unit. And the browser says, OK, I'm going to multiply each of the color channels by the alpha first for every one of these color stops. Now, GPU, I want you to draw me the color at this particular point, say 40% here. And the GPU, GPU says, OK, so what's the value of the, the red here? LERP is just shorthand for linear interpolation, because no one likes reading or writing that. And the browser says, all right, well, this is the value, but don't touch it. Don't multiply it by the alpha at all, please. And the GPU goes, uh, yeah, all right, all right, but I still need the alpha to calculate the background color. So the browser gives it. And the GPU says, all right, so I'll just take your original calculated value and the value of the background that I've worked out and then give you the nice value here, which is what you actually want. And if we look back at the graphs, you apply pre-multiplied alpha to the color channels, and you get the exact same linear slope of value, which is effectively, when you add in the red of the background, you get it filled the entire way. And when you think about it, this is red to transparent on a white background. You're actually just making a gradient from red to white. And this is what pre-multiplied alpha gives us. The really important thing that took me a while to understand was that it's the value of the background you're drawing it on that makes all the difference. If you don't actually want to try and calculate this yourself, because it's horrible, I have written a plugin for PostCSS which will handle all of this for you. It will take any of your gradients that you've defined with the transparent keyword and will rewrite the color stops and add in extra color stops in order to always have that smooth transition. If you've got values that have an alpha somewhere between 0 and 1, can't really help because Safari will just screw those up completely. OK, that's, that's a fair amount of maths, and it's late in the afternoon. Any big circus has the, the, the final act, the grand finale, the one that really shows off and is not actually particularly practical. So keeping in mind that this is a perfect use case for SVG, and it's a horrible abuse of gradients, and you should never do this in production, if you perhaps wrote some sort of generator that took an image and broke it down into a whole bunch of different linear gradients, different sizes and colors and positions. And then you ask the browser to carefully stack them together and bring them up. You can produce some very interesting designs. Thank you very much. <laughs>